So I guess I've given myself a totally paradoxical task, <clears throat> but that's sort of the heart of the matter. And uh, thank you for actually being here at this early hour after a, a magnificent Saturday night. So. So the unspeakable, when you, uh, when you speak about it uh, in psychedelic experience, uh, William James considered ineffability to be a hallmark of mystical experience. And so one question one can ask is, uh, what are the bridging languages that can be strung element by element across the abyss, separating high-dose psychedelics and baseline reality? So I believe that psyche, the old Greek word that includes mind and soul and spirit in one, sometimes gives birth to novel language in the face of the ineffable. And Terence McKenna said, that's why it's so important to communicate, for all of us to put our best foot forward, to put our best metaphors on the table, because we can move no faster than the evolution of our language. And this is certainly part of what the psychedelics are about. <clears throat> they force the evolution of language. And no culture, so far as I am aware, has ever consciously tried to evolve its language with the awareness that evolving language was evolving reality. So further, the observation and the description and the interpretation of linguistic phenomena, and those are three steps. In the psychedelic sphere, it takes place on shifting sand. Here's why. The psychedelic states, through chemical action on our neurotransmitter systems, disrupt the functioning of natural language symbolic systems. They destabilize the experience of self. In other words, the who that's observing, who is observing when your who is changing. And further, who are those others that are encountered in psychedelic states? And that has a lot to do with the development of these kind of communication things. Natural language cannot by definition address the unspeakable, but the unspeakable can address us as linguistic creatures on its own terms at its own behest, with its own timing, and utilizing its own symbolic systems. Terence McKenna again. Those who grasp a piece of the action end up with two things on their plate, the experience and their own idiosyncratic explanation of the experience based on what they have read, seen, and been told. The experience is private, personal, the best part, and ultimately unspeakable. The more you know, the quieter you get. The explanation is another matter and can be attempted. In fact, it must be told, for the Logos speaks and we are its tools and its voice. I have my own experience equally unspeakable and my explanation equally prolix. And this is a wonderful thing. Maria Sabina, one of the principal ones, spoke to me and said, Maria Sabina, this is the book of wisdom. It is the book of language. Everything that is written in it is for you. The book is yours. Take it so you can work. And then, this is Henry Munns, one of my favorite things about language. It is not I who speak, said Heraclitus. It is the Logos. Language is an ecstatic activity of signification. Intoxicated by the mushrooms, the fluency, the ease, the aptness of expression one becomes capable of are such that one is astounded by the words that issue forth from the content, from the contact of the intention of articulation with the matter of experience. So there's a short list of types of linguistic phenomena that uh, I have found in myself and in others that are <clears throat> part of uh, you know, what, what you find when you go out there. And so, you know, first of all, this uh, dissolution of natural language, Stanley Krippner did an early paper on that and talking about all the ways that language falls apart um, at, you know, as you um, go through the psychedelic um, process of getting into it. Uh, what's on your right is, 
is an example of, um, I'm going to turn the sound off, is an example of uh, the language that I've been working with. It's uh, two-dimensional, it's called, on the bottom, and it's called Glide. And then I made software <clears throat> to make the language so I could write with the language in three dimensions, and that's what you see at, at the top of the screen. So you have all these things, dissolution of natural language, glossolalia, anybody heard glossolalia? Uh -huh, right, okay. And the voice of the logos, Howard Beach did a whole uh, uh, PhD thesis on that, uh, that you know, basically showed that a majority of people who take psilocybin at one point or another hear a voice. And uh, Ikaros, songs given by the other, visual languages, etc. <clears throat> Okay, everything is deeply intertwingled. This slide is here because intertwingled is a word you should know. Uh, it's a very psychedelic word uh, invented by Ted Nelson, uh, who's a computer visionary. So <clears throat> kind of brings up, brings to mind like tingling and mingling and inter intertwining and twinkling and, and uh, kind of getting together. And to me it expresses uh, that primary psychedelic vision of interconnectedness. So things can intertwingle, and this was the point of that uh, waves thing. Things can intertwingle, my opinion, because stuff is made of waves at every level. Just observe. So language and consciousness are deeply, deeply, deeply intertwingled. And language and consciousness are co-evolving. These are the two things that uh, I, I am, ex you know, have been examining. <clears throat> so, what is language? You know, how did language originate? Well, right off the bat, nobody knows how language originated. Uh, there are many theories. It's a wonderful thing to talk about and argue. But if anybody tries to tell you they actually know how language originated in the human race, they don't. <clears throat> there is a lack obviously, for obvious reasons, of material evidence. So the first thing we have in the way of language is petroglyphs. Do you think petroglyphs were the very first thing? Well, no, they're the first thing that got saved. So we're swept away by language into the human community. We swim in language. Our thoughts, plans, the stories we form about who we are and what our place is in the world, the ego structures, are all built of language. We are filled to the brim with language. Language stores our memories. <clears throat> we have labels for sensations, feeling, ideas. So immersed, where can we stand to be able to view language? And this is a really important question. Because <clears throat> if you're using language to describe language, you're already in a very reflexive situation. So, it's very related to the question of can consciousness observe itself? So if we're structuring our, our baseline consciousness, in part at least with language, how can consciousness observe itself? This is the big problem. This is the, uh, the scientific problem. But you know, when, is there any other means to observe consciousness other than the person's own consciousness? So psychedelics can transport us to a land before and after natural language into the unspeakable. To study the relationship of language and consciousness, then, is to examine the relationship of two deeply self-reflexive entities. Okay. There's nothing, nothing natural about natural language, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. So McKenna's stoned ape theory, <clears throat> you know, uh, we were uh, hominids, we were early humans, uh, we encountered in foraging our, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the mushroom, and the mushroom propelled us into language. <clears throat> well, that's a really interesting theory. The question is, if the mushrooms in the present moment, if someone is taking mushrooms in the present moment, and it's propelling them into new languages, what does this mean? You know, it makes his, his speculation at least as good as some of the others. <clears throat> Anyhow, 
think about language. Language is not nat natural language is what linguists call everything we speak, every variety. And there's nothing natural about it. It's installed. It's installed by your mom and all the people around you and by the television set. <clears throat> You're not born with it. You're born with some capacity to learn it really well. That's built in. But you will not have language unless somebody teaches you. And natural language, and this is my opinion, when you get out there in psychedelic states, natural language is very slow software. Okay. I think it's important for, to think about what myth we're living in. You, know, you, can get, you, know, you can get a certain insight for that. So the words psychedelic and psychonaut take us back to the Greek word psyche, the soul, mind, spirit, breath, and life the invisible animating principle or entity which occupies and directs the physical body. So that's the psyche part. Nautus is the Greek word for sailor or navigator, which makes us soul sailors, the ones who navigate the psyche. The broad concept psyche, so central to human beingness, is personified in the myth of psyche and eros. So this is the once upon a time part of the talk. <clears throat> Psyche was a mortal princess, so beautiful that the goddess Aphrodite was jealous and commanded her son Eros to shoot her with one of his arrows so that she would fall in love with the first thing she saw and hopefully that would be a monster. Of course, when Eros saw her beauty, he was so stunned he dropped his arrow, pricking himself and therefore falling hopelessly in love with Psyche. Okay, Eros is in love with Psyche. Psyche is then abandoned on a mountaintop as a sacrifice by her father who believes the prophecy that she will marry a monster. Eros rescues her and carries her to his palace where she is lavishly served by invisible hands. He brings her to his bed, but always in the dark. <clears throat> Why? He's still trying to avoid his mother's anger. So, <clears throat> then... She is never ever to see his face. So Psyche is now prevented from seeing the face of love. Who could, <laughs> so she, she exercises the divine right of curiosity to see the face of love. And who could resist the temptation? She is equally overcome by love's beauty, accidentally spills hot lamp oil on him, he wakes up, she's banished, she wanders around in the world, she does a bunch of impossible tasks with the help of animal allies, and she is reunited with Eros. They can see each other now for who they are, and they are in the full light. Does this have anything to do with what we're doing? Okay, so in this myth, the soul seeks to see the face of love, and love needs a soul to fill. But this is a high-risk adventure, okay? Eros is a gorgeous, inadvertent monster in part of the entanglement. The psychological meaning of psyche, and here's, here's what's happened to psyche. Here's what's happened to soul sailing. The psychological meaning of psyche as mind in the modern sense, identified with brain, divorced from soul, and no longer tasked with seeking love, did not come into use until 1910. Okay? We thought differently about psyche. Imagine the vast and starry splendor of the soul devolves to mind, and mind becomes individually packaged brains in little skull cases. And that all happened in a hundred years. So, psychonautics is, in my opinion, a practice. What is a practice? Something, it, it's a practice in the sense that Sufi ecstatic dancing is a practice, or Kung Fu is a practice, or optometry is a practice, or nursing is a practice, or, you know, go on and on. Guitar, playing your guitar is a practice. But <clears throat> practices, are distinguished by doing, not by theorizing. It doesn't mean you don't know lots of theory, but your practice is something you do. 
we return to psyche as psychonauts, as practic you know, practicing psychonauts, we return to psyche again and again. So you can study law or you can study psychedelics for that matter without ever practicing, but it is practicing which identifies psychonautics and a practice is fundamentally individual, personal, something done by a subject, a self. A meditation or yoga practitioner may practice alone or in a group. A practice by its nature repetitive improves skills. Knowledge is gained over time. Therefore, a practice can be a site for research. Okay, let's think about this for a moment. We have the clinical track, we have a fantastic rebirth of psychedelic uh, legitimate research, okay? What would be the ratio, and we don't have these figures, what's the ratio between authorized research and unauthorized research, okay? I'm betting that we have a room full of unauthorized researchers as well as authorized researchers. What is it, is it 99 to one? <laughs> Is it, you know, what's the ratio? So I think that, you know, I think we have a certain responsibility to think of ourselves as researchers and to make our knowledge known in whatever way is appropriate, you know, from that, from that practice. And to think of what you're doing as a practice, that, that it, it can be a combination of all these practices, a healing practice, a spiritual practice, a psychotherapeutic practice, an artistic practice, and, uh, but a practice, a practice. Okay, risky business. So, this is another aspect of the unspeakability, the legal status. You can't just jump up and you know, put it on the internet, I'm having an LSD party on Friday night, come on, come on over, we're, you know, we're exploring. <clears throat> That's an unspeakability, and that is a deep unspeakability because it includes all the fears of getting caught, okay? And then that's on top of the other fears that you can encounter with self-experimentation. Fear of loss of control, I think, is the thing I hear more, more than anything else. Fear of going and not coming back. Fear of getting stuck in a bad trip. Fear of coming back to baseline with the realization that this is the ultimate bad trip. And, <laughs> you know, you gotta, really, <laughs> I had, <laughs> you gotta get used to it. <laughs> and, you know, fear of identity dissolution and psychosis. Um, you know, I really wish it were that easy to take the ego apart, you know, but we need that. We really need that. It's not the enemy. And it, you know, neatly comes back together in most cases. So, I like the, uh, the dangers of level confusion and psychological inflation. That's where you hear, newly initiated shaman seeks tribe. <laughs> Anybody heard that? <laughs> Alien hybrid messiah accepting disciples and donations. <laughs> so you know how you can get, you know, inflation is, it can be a problem. And then you have the politics of knowledge, um, you know, which is easy to see. <clears throat> this is a small room way apart from the grand ballroom where the clinical track is. There's a reason for that. So we have a divided field. We have the in-laws. Okay, people who are operating within the law, and we have the outlaws, and that's us. <laughs> so there are methodological problems, all right, in, in studying, in, in psychonautics. Okay, one of them, and my favorite, <laughs> is premature interpretation. <laughs> okay, that's when you come back from the trip, you, you know, it's your first one or your second one, and you know everything because you had that experience, and you're gonna tell people exactly what the psychedelic experience is, and what ayahuasca does, or what 2CB does, or whatever. No, that's, that's your trip. <laughs> but that anxiety, that because we want to say what happened in some way, we want to bring it back, we want to bring home the bacon. And that can be often a reductive impulse. Well, that was just my brain on drugs, <laughs> or whatever. There's another problem, which is withheld data. And this is another aspect of unspeakability. I think if you've read Rick Strassman's book, The Spirit Molecule, and other things he's written, 
later, he ran into this head-on because all of a sudden his DMT subjects were experiencing entities, elf-like things, all those you know very strange things, aliens they identified them as sometimes. That was, their, that was the reality that was being experienced. But then as a, as a legitimate researcher, you go, ah, I don't want to say that. I don't want to say that happened. That makes the whole thing sound you know, like, like a UFO convention with drugs, you know. And, and so, you know, you withhold things because the content is too crazy sounding when you get back to baseline. And so then you, you put it in a little thing and, and uh, you either deal with it or you don't deal with it. And there are reputations to protect. Uh, there's also, uh, intrinsic to the experience, often there's state-bound memory. In other words, how do you, how do you remember in some usable fashion, what happened. And Charles Tart talks about this, you know, levels of consciousness and, and Tom Roberts as well, um, multi-state realities. And that's one way <clears throat> to get around that methodological problem is to clearly identify that we're dealing with different levels of reality. But if you can't tell the truth about what happened, or you don't want to because of these reasons, your phenomenological rigor will suffer if you can't say what you experienced. And Benny Shannon, who wrote The Antipodes of the Mind, states the case for first-hand long-term experience as a methodological issue that I find paramount. Shannon asserts that first-hand experience is essential, that there is no alternative to studying phenomenology from within. He considers that the studies where the investigator has no or very limited and cautious experience with the brew limits the value of such studies and makes the analogy of trying to write about music without ever having heard it. So there's a lack of, of longitudinal data, and some of the clinical studies are starting to move in that direction, like with ketamine. You know, we know as a one-shot, ketamine will just take a person from you know wanting to jump off a roof to a far better state of mind in one shot, and this is really being pursued right now. Thank heavens. <clears throat> but who has the longitudinal data? Who has made many trips, gone through an evolution, developed their practice, learned different things, come to do? Well, a lot of the people in this room. So here's, here's how I managed to turn about 500,000 words of notebooks <laughs> in notebooks um, into a PhD dissertation, okay? So my methodology, I did it what's called a practice-based dissertation. Okay, nurses do this, teachers have done this, and now I did it as a psychonaut. And I called it a technoetic practice because it was about knowledge, and, it was, and it, I used technology as part of what I was doing. I used the software that I developed. My, um, my instrumentation, you can see MDMA, LSD, psilocybin, a Wii remote, and uh, 2CB. Um, the first thing I did in writing the dissertation was to write a novel because that gave me a fictional means to work out all the details of the language by putting it in a context, a world, and, uh, and letting it tell me about itself and let the characters tell me. So that became the underpinnings. It's the invisible underpainting under the, the thesis. <clears throat> Anyhow, there was a novel, there's a psychedelic self-exploration, software development, and the academic side. So I used a lot of neurophenomenology in terms of my other, other theory I was looking at. And uh, those are the people that, that I work, you know, whose work I used, um, Lachlan and Michael Winkleman, Harry Hunt, and Francisco Varela. And in, from anthropology, Jeremy Norby, and rhetoric, which is my background, um, Richard Doyle. So neurophenomenology studies consciousness relating the physical and functional organization of, <clears throat> or of the brain to the subjective reports of lived, sorry, 
of lived experience in altered states as mutually informative without reducing consciousness to one or the other. And this is, this is really critical. It's like, it, it, they never try to go, it's just the brain, or they no, don't go, it's just the, the spirits from outside, <laughs> you know, it's like, Bringing the spirit, bringing those two viewpoints together. So that's neurophenomenology, and consciousness is seen as a dynamic, multi-state process of the recursive interaction of biology and culture. So as we went through this enormous explosion of of cultural development and completely changed our context of living, very few of us live in the original context of nature. We live in a completely human and symbolically built um, world. Uh, there's a very simple the <laughs> the picture of the brain and basically Michael Winkleman is, has a very s great way of looking at psychedelics as psychointegrators. What altered states of consciousness do is not only synchronize the frontal cortex but basically make the frontal cortex pay attention to what's happening in the rest of the brain. Okay, there's a, there's a packaged brain description. <clears throat> so here's another 50 cent word for you. Uh, xenolinguistics, it's a word that comes from science fiction. And I use it to, um, to talk about the study of language in the psychedelic sphere. And I use the word scientific deliberately uh, because I think that phenomenology is an, you know, an essential part and method for studying psychedelics. <clears throat> so what about these non-human intelligences that we're speaking to? <clears throat> There's uh, Pablo Amaringo, you know, spirits everywhere of all different sorts in ayahuasca experience. So the, the other wears many masks you know, spirits, allies, familiars, um, anyhow, I don't have to read this all to you, but the other uses a variety of means to communicate, and that can be the, the visions that you're seeing, the visionary presentation, the songs, the meaningful sound, the scripts that, you know, people see scripts written all over everything, the complete symbolic systems, interior voices or telepathy, touch and uh, gestural languages, you know, you know what happens to your hands, right? And visual puns, all different kinds of things. <clears throat> Contemporary psychonauts are not necessarily embedded in a tradition, and they have the task of creating their own contexts, I should say our own contexts, and interpretations and protocols or rituals to contain the experiences. And that's within each community of practice, whether it's a healing community, a spiritual community, or some of everything. So what's the ontological status of the other? Ontology is study of being. Are these guys really real? Who are these guys anyway? Um, Psychedelics routinely perturb the baseline experience of self. Self, selves, elves, shift, transform, multiply, merge with the other or others. The other appears as logos, the voice of the teaching voice that McKenna speaks about and Horace Beach studied. The other communicates through the self. <clears throat> A way hell is one of the Tzotzil Maya's two souls. It is an animal soul that connects man to nature and is indispensable to his life on earth. One of the most powerful forms of way hell is the writer, Scribano. This kind of way hell is Im immortal because even after death, she can recreate herself through marks on a piece of paper, or as Pedro Pitar explains, they invent themselves writing themselves into existence. And this phenomena is, you know, I've, I've seen this with, with some of the xenolinguists that I've been talking to. So these are the kind of themes that come up over and over again in the xenolinguist world that, uh, that, that I've, I've been discussing. 
psychedelic origin of language, that stone ape theory, or aliens came and gave it to us, or God gave me language, which is what most language has, the origin stories are divine, you know, natural language origin stories. Uh, the idea that language is evolving and at an accelerated pace. Uh, all, you know, a lot of uh, discussion of perceptual modalities of language, uh, interdimensional kind of languages. What does that mean? Well, it's a word that is brought back and used. Perception of more than the baseline number of uh, dimensions where we're watching. Wave structures are very prominent uh, in some um, uh, mine in particular, it's all waves. Fractal structures. Uh, and then there's, of course, translinguistic matter, which I cornered Dennis McKenna about once, and nobody really knows what it is, but it says those wonderful violet purple fluid things that shamans you know can sweat out or vomit out or spit out or or you can see and you know i see them i call it the blue shift you know and all of a sudden oh my god these huge blobs of of stuff and they're food for me <clears throat> they're energetic food alchemy divination I Ching comes up over and over again not just in terence mckenna's work 2012 meme very you know was there and new logical systems. This is really, you know, I, I don't have time to go into all this, but you know, we need new logics. We've been working on a binary logic for a long time, and it's gotten us exactly where it's gotten us, which is, you know, very civilized. And but it's built on a logic of the excluded middle. So you can't include a term in your logic that might include a paradox, for instance. <clears throat> so the Guild of Xenolinguists. Uh, I'm going to try to get out of this and show you, this is my website, and it's way too big, I need to change this, but that's okay. Um, yeah. What I really want to do is go to the guild, and I want to show you one Xenolinguist work in, in detail. Okay, th this is a, a couple named uh, Gaetan and Carolyn Cottero Miro. They kept to a six day a week diet of Proganum Harmala for a year, during which Karen ta uh, tattooed Gaetan's back using neuromediators, uh, such as pinaline and ayahuasca, in, uh, in, in under, under the pigments. The work covers a temple plan for a fierce bird and a twisting serpentine form covered with languages and symbolic forms. They discovered that each neuromediator has a specific signature of fluorescence under black light. This is like amazing. So I met these guys in, in Norway and we're sitting in the, in the cafe and, and they're describing, you know, I'd seen the pictures on the screen and I said, can I see the actual real thing? <laughs> so, so, you know, Gaetan was nice enough to take a shirt off in the, in the coffee shop and, uh, and display this incredible thing. It, and it's got all kinds of known and unknown languages. But what really fascinates me, I, I mentioned the rainbow serpent. You know, and that serpent, you know, whatever we call it, we, I call it the rainbow serpent, the kundalini energy, the chi, the, you know, whatever that is, that tremendous wavy, curly serpentine energy um, is just very much part of that. That is that serpentine rainbow serpent and, and the rainbow serpent can almost shed language, you know, in its passing. So that's, that's that. And here's, his whole body is, is um, covered with tattoos and they do various art, art, you know, art installations of all different sorts. So there's, there's Gaetan under a, a different kind of light. So, you know, if you're interested, um, you can go over to the, you know, to that website, uh, psychedelicsandlanguage.com. And I'm gonna leave this on the screen. These are details um, from, from the original drawing that she made. I don't know exactly why it said. Oh, that that's just a button that says stop. Okay, any other questions? Wait, wait. <laughs>
Woo!